everyone. My name is Merle Massey. I'm the coordinator for undergraduate research at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm here today to present on the three minute poster talk plus the elevator pitch. And I will be looking a little bit sideways because I'm going to be looking at my own screen as I give this presentation. And so I will turn my video off, but I just wanted to say hello. Thank you for joining us today and uh, welcome to our presentation. So the three minute poster talk plus the elevator pitch. This is for the SURE program at the University of Saskatchewan. This is what we're going to be talking about today. If we can get the computers to listen to me. All right. First, we'll start off with my land acknowledgement. This I built myself. As a settler Canadian of Scottish, Irish, Norwegian, Swedish, and Ukrainian tradition, I am filled with gratitude to live within Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. I give respect to the First Nations and Métis of this place and continually value our interconnectedness through Wakutuwin. I too love this land of vast skies and tall trees, Saskatoons and blueberries, and the swift and slow waters of the Saskatchewan River. So if you didn't know, you can actually take the class at the U of S to modify the land acknowledgement so that it is personal to you. And I took that class last winter and I found it extremely valuable. If you get a chance, I do recommend it. So today we're going to be talking about the three minute lightning talk for posters. Some of you are going to be presenting uh, this summer at the end of summer at the uh, summer symposium for the SURE program. This is for undergraduate students across the University of Saskatchewan uh, to present a poster or a presentation on your summer research. So if you're giving a poster, because we are doing it online, we will also need you to record a three minute overview of your research. And that's what I'm focusing on today. But later on, if any of you go on to do any graduate studies, you might be invited to participate in what's called a three minute thesis. And that is very similar. And so the process that what I'm going to be talking about today is actually very similar to the three minute thesis. But these are the three things that we're going to be covering today. Number one, I want you to aim for a non specialist audience. I didn't say a non-academic audience, it will still be an academic audience for the most part for our symposium, but a non-specialist. They may not be a specialist in your particular area of research. So we'll talk about what that looks like and who you might pitch it for. The second that a thing that we're going to cover today is that the oral talk enhances and sells the research. This is about you telling us personally in that three minute video what was really important about your research and what you want people to remember. So your oral talk, you're not just going to read the poster in three minutes, you're going to enhance and sell what you did. And the third thing we're going to talk about today is the benefit of practice, 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 and what that looks like. So first of all, we're gonna talk about your audience. This picture actually is me, that's my back to the camera, presenting to graduate students uh, in SENS, I'm an adjunct faculty member in SENS in the School of Environment and Sustainability here on campus. And this was in 2012 when we took a group of students up to uh, Emma Lake and Prince Albert National Park. So first of all is your audience. Your challenge in your three minutes is how to explain your work to a non-specialist audience. So it's good to have someone in mind. If you happen to have a friend uh, that you've made here on campus, someone outside your lab, ideally, but an under, another undergraduate student uh, or maybe a friend who's a graduate student who does not have the same background as you. And that's the most critical part. You need to prepare your work to talk to someone who has absolutely no background in what you're doing. That way you learn how to pitch it and take it down to a level that more people can understand. You want your whole audience to understand what your research is. So you need to explain your work to a non-specialist audience. When I write, because I'm a historian and his, his story, history is fairly universal, I generally pitch it to my aunt who was a school teacher. If I can pitch it in a way that she can understand, she's educated, she's read lots of history, she loves history. She actually did study a little bit of history herself, but just someone who's educated and, um, but it doesn't have a particular specialty in your background. That's who you pitch it for. The second part is that we're asking you to give a good explanation in three minutes. 
And what that shows is mastery of your subject matter. And that will impress both the audience and the judges. The better you can communicate what you know and how you got there, the better your presentation will be. So you want to give as best an explanation as you can in three minutes. That's your challenge. So how do we do this? There's, it sounds pretty impossible. How do you take months and months worth of research? And if you're working with a faculty member who's been working on a particular research question for a long time, a number of months, a number of years, how do you distill that down into three minutes? Well, the first thing is actually to think about it from the audience perspective. What does the audience want or need to know? What do they, what are they going to be most interested about in your research? You might be studying worms, for example, but your larger goal perhaps is to address issues of Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. And you're studying these worms and how they react to particular chemicals because we already know that humans react to those chemicals. And so you're studying that. So you're, you're, you might be studying worms, but your larger goal might be working on Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So audience perspective, what do they want or need to know about your work? What's the connection to you? So there's two bits to that. They want to know what you did and they also want to know why you did it. Those are the two pieces and parts that they're looking for. The second and the most important part of this, in my opinion, is plain language. When you're doing an oral presentation, you want to make sure that you are breaking down what you're saying into simple words, simple phrases, simple sentences. No jargon, no acronyms, and no academic language. Funny story, I don't know how, if any of you have uh, received money from any of the tri-council agencies uh, at the federal level, but one of them, because I'm a historian, I get money sometimes from SHRC, which of course is an acronym spelt S-S-H-R-C, but we say it SHRC, and, we, and it's a, a short form word that we use on campus all the time. And I would say that, oh, mom, I want a, a SHRC postdoctoral fellowship, aren't, you know, I'm, this is so great. When mom wrote it down, if she was going to write someone a letter, she spelt it S-H-I-R-K as if I wasn't doing any work at all and shirking my work. So it's funny, acronyms, we use them all the time, but acronyms are usually very specific to your particular lab. So try not to use them. Try not to use any weird jargon that no one else outside your lab or your research group would understand, and certainly no academic language. If you're going to use the word utilize, please do me a favor and change that to use, especially for your oral presentation. You want short words, short sentences, and short paragraphs. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you can make sure you get there. The second aspect of how that I want to cover is that you do need to explain concepts and background that's necessary for your audience. There will be people in your background and in your audience who have absolutely no science background. For example, explain your stuff to me. I'm a historian. Do you think about me when you're writing your stuff. Tell me about any particular concepts or background that will be necessary for me to understand what you're doing and what you've done. Do this at the highest level that you can. Don't enter the weeds. Don't start telling me about um, some kind of esoteric argument between uh, two scientists or two groups of scientists or two science labs that they've been throwing at each other through academic journal articles for years and years. Keep whatever the background it is that, you, that I need to know, keep it at a very high level. Don't enter the weeds and get into the high level theory or really complex concepts or words. You only have three minutes. You don't have time for that. So make sure you keep it at a very high level. Your enthusiasm matters. It will present itself in your voice. It will present itself in how you see, how you think, how you feel, and in, in the way that you choose to express your ideas. Your enthusiasm matters. What makes you excited about your work? What makes you excited? What drew you in in the first place? People want to know that. They want to hear your enthusiasm and see and feel it. Take a breather. All right. Oral presentation is about sharing your work. In essence, this is about storytelling. 
And what do the best storytellers do? They find a way to connect. They find a way to connect with you and to connect with the audience. And here are some of uh, just a few basic ideas of how we can do that. So how to tell a research story in three minutes and connect. If you take a look at this particular audience, you got one guy who's staring off into space and drinking a cup of coffee. A couple of people who are definitely watching what's going on. But if you see the lady in the back with a big smile on her face, that's the audience member that you want. That's the audience member that we all want. The one who's at the back, eyes wide open, watching what you're doing with a big smile on their face. So this is how you get there. I want you to create a plan with a goal. What do you want the audience to remember? Those of you who were at my talk last week, I talked about the one big thing. What's the one big thing that when you build your poster, what's the one thing that you want the audience to remember about your work? So that's where I want you to start. That's how I want you to, to build your presentation. Once you have that, then you can break it down and build on the couple, two or three things that you'll do to fill that out. But we'll get to that in a second. So start with your plan. Start with your goal. What do you want the audience to remember? Then you will be able to frame and focus your key points. Then you open with a hook. This is by far the best way to engage your audience to get them interested in what you're doing. I'm gonna give, there are many, many ways that you can do a hook and you can certainly go um, research a few more on, on the internet, but I'm gonna give four ideas here. The first is to spark curiosity. What happens when? For example, what happens when lightning hits a tree? What happens to the lightning? What happens to the tree? What happens to the ground? What happens to any of the animals or bugs that are on the tree, on or in the tree? So you can spark curiosity by opening with a question. That works really, really well. A second is to start with a story. Now, when you only have three minutes, you can't tell a big, long story. It has to be quick, 25 words, just a bit of an opening story. When I was 15, I was standing in the middle of a field when lightning hit a tree. And this is how I got interested in this particular talk. So a story clip. You can also use an analogy or a metaphor. This is particularly useful if you're doing a science-based project that's a little bit esoteric or a little bit difficult to explain. Those of you who, who have something like that, an analogy or a metaphor is your uh, savior. For example, people don't necessarily understand why our current COVID-19 crisis, why is it called a coronavirus? And so you explain, if you look at the coronavirus, in a microscope, it actually has a crown of thorns around it. It has these point, it is like a pointed crown all the way around the virus. And that's why it's called a coronavirus. So that, that gives an explanation. So an analogy or a metaphor uh, will go a long way to explaining what's happening with you. You can also start with making a statement, a fact, a statistic, an opinion, or a declaration. Often, let's go back to the lightning strike. Uh, example. Let's say that you opened with, did you know that last year in the United States, 352 people were hit by lightning? I just made that up. I have no idea if that's a true fact. I pulled that number out of my head, so don't write that down. But make a statement, pull out a statistic, an opinion, or a declaration. A de declaration works really well if you're talking about something that's fairly controversial. You can make your statement right off the top, and then you spend your time backing it up. This is the second half of how to tell a research story. So you've thought about how, which part of your research that you really want people to remember. You've kind of thought about it in your head. You've got your, your hook, you've crafted, you've decided what your hook's going to be. Now your job is to hammer it home. Plan two or three key points. Try not to go more than three. Some people will squeeze in four. Definitely do not go five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Do not do that. Too many points and your audience will forget. They haven't got the space in their mind to, to um, capture that all and hold it in. Two or three key points is all that they can hold. Take the time to explain each one and show how they connect both to your larger one big, one big thing that you want them to remember and also how they connect to each other. So take the time to connect. That is the bulk, the crux of your presentation. This is by far the, the center of what you're doing and how you're going to spend the bulk of your three minutes, probably close to two minutes, but even slightly more. Then 
you want to talk about paths backward and forward. So what were the gaps in your own work? This is really, really good to showcase that you understand that, that no research project is ever perfect. Say where you are and say, you know, I haven't finished the analysis. Say, you know, whatever it is, show the gaps that you are, are aware of the gaps in your own work and maybe even what you would do differently next time. And also going forward from that, where do you think this research would go next? When you're doing a poster, when you're doing the three minute presentation that goes with your poster, your judges will be watching for that because it shows your understanding, not only of your research and, and, and what you did, but also where it fits in the larger research context. And that's important. So talk about where your research could go next. And then sum it all up. Pretty much restate everything that you just told them. Tell them what they just learned and give them their one big thing that you want them to take away. So that's how you tell a research story. Basically, you're the tour guide, you're the cheerleader, and you're the storyteller. You are there to direct their attention to particular areas. You are there to show your enthusiasm. You're the cheerleader for particular research, and you're the tour guide. They're looking to you to tell them what you want them to know, and also to tell them what they need to know in order to truly understand what you've done. You're the tour guide, you're the cheerleader, you're the storyteller. I actually do want you to write or plan it out. Take the time, take a piece of paper, open a new document and write it out. Make your plan. Know your key points, but keep it short. If you have about 300 words of text on your poster, you'll have the same or a little bit, actually quite a bit less. You'll probably have about 150 words, maybe, maybe 175 um, for a three minute, depending on how fast you talk for a three minute presentation. I want you to use your strongest, most active voice. And I mean that both in the way that you present it and also in the words that you choose. Speak with persuasion, speak with declaration. You are the expert in this particular subject matter. You can be bold, you can be confident, but your number one job, and I don't care if it's a journal article or uh, a blog post or a poster or your three minute presentation or a 20 minute oral presentation at a conference, I don't care what it is that you're working on. When you are sharing your work, your job, your number one job is to be persuasive. You need to show them that you knew what you did, why you did it, how well it went, and where you're going to go next. You need to be persuasive so that you want your audience to be nodding their head along with whatever you're saying. The last point is that this is conversation style. Every time you do something orally and you're walking people through your research, this is conversation style, not academic style. Do make sure that you are using the short words the, the short sentences, easy words, and that you're creating that connection between people. So this is not an academic style. This is not where you can show uh, your longest words, your most jargon words, your as true obfuscation words. No, don't do that. Choose conversation style. And then finally, this is our third point of the day. Practice, practice, practice. I want you to practice by yourself. I want you to practice. Maybe you have a puppy or a kitty or some other animal and they're looking at you funny, that's fine too. Or a friend, uh, someone like me. Read, once you have your written text of what you're going to say in your three minute presentation, read it out loud and time yourself. What you'll find, I have, I have written, I've now published uh, three books. My third book is coming out at the end of August. I read the whole book out loud twice. The reason why you do that, it's one of the best editing tools out there. If you're stumbling or struggling when you're trying to read it out loud, other people will stumble or struggle trying to read the text. And especially since you're going to be doing your oral presentation out loud, you definitely don't want to have any areas where you're stumbling or struggling. So if you find those areas, revise. If you find that you are over your three minutes, cut and then revise some more. Try and make it as smooth as you can. Read it out loud again. Once you've got it down to that three minutes, you know, give or take five or five or so seconds either way, 
I want you to practice with an audience. Try and find a friend, a roommate, uh, your mom, your aunt, whoever you can cajole or convince to sit down and watch you give your presentation. They And ask them, while you're doing that, ask them to, to, to take a look at how you're speaking your words. Are you too fast? Are you too slow? Is there anything that people can't hear or understand? How can you make it better? Or on a content level, was there anything about their presentation that they didn't understand? Did you lose them at any point in the way? Did they get confused? Did they not maybe, were they not able to make a jump from one thought to the next thought? Practice with an audience and then incorporate their feedback and go back through the whole thing again until you feel like you're finally ready and that you have three solid minutes of a presentation. Vocal range. You are on stage. If you see the picture that you see, so that's my son um, back when he was much younger uh, uh, laughing at you. He's uh, 18 now and just finished first year geology. That's my mom right behind him. That's Dr. Maureen Reed from SENS next to my mom. This was at a book launch uh, back in uh, 2013. But when you are on stage, your vocal range matters. So these are some of the things that I want you to do. You need to be clear and precise. So I want you to warm up before your presentation. And that is even before you do. You are going to be doing this presentation probably in your office or even in your bedroom somewhere in your house. I want you to remove all the outside distractions, all the outside noises as much as you can. Get your space ready for when you're going to record your presentation. But before you record it, I want you to warm up your body. Whether you do some stretching, whether you do some power poses, whether you do five or ten jumping jacks, I do want you to warm up your body. I also want you to warm up your voice. This is a classic trick. Uh, for anyone who is on the stage or anyone who's giving a public presentation. Take the time to warm up your voice. There are vocal exercises that you can find online, but even if you just go lu 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 la 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 li 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 lo 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 and then do that with a few different uh, vowels and consonants, that will help you warm up your voice. Do some humming, do some ooh. I know it sounds funny, but it does make your voice warm up. The second is to think about your voice tools and your tricks. One is pace, your pacing. When you speak fast, usually you're representing excitement. This was something that got you really excited. You do have to watch that you don't get too fast. And this is something that I have worked on. I tend to speak very fast. And so I have worked on slowing myself down because slow and measured allows your audience time to process and time to think about what you've done, particularly important. If you are talking to a mixed audience where not everyone speaks the same language as what you're speaking as their, as their home language. At the university level, the number of people who, for whom English is the first language and, and our presentations at the U of S are usually in English. The number of, of people who have English as a first language is much smaller than you might think, including many of your professors. So slow, measured, and thoughtful for your audience. Second is pitch. You can go really loud. I'm very loud. I probably just blew out your eardrums. Or you can go quite soft and people have to lean in and listen. I tend to have a high voice and so I've worked on pitching my voice a little bit low and that matters as well. Tone is the final. You want to be friendly and connecting. If you're sitting back and you're laying in bed giving your presentation, that will affect your tone. If you are, if you didn't like your research and you thought it was stupid, that will affect your tone. If you're bored or just disgusted with your research, that will also affect your tone. So do find ways to be friendly, connecting, and upright. Don't rush. That's the final. Give your audience time to process whatever it is that you're working on. Your body language. Your body language matters. When I give a presentation, particularly in public, um, I was at a conference in Europe, and the rest of the presentation panel, they gave their presentations sitting down, and most of them were reading there. So not only were they sitting, 
They were looking down at their pieces of paper in front of them. People at the back of the room couldn't hear them. When it was my turn, I, don't, I cannot present sitting down. I need to present specially live, standing. Usually I walk around. So I stood to give my presentation. Everyone could hear me, everyone could respond. At the end, I had almost all the questions, in, not because my presentation was better or my content was better, there was excellent work done on the rest of the panel, but because the audience very simply could not hear them, that made a difference and I ended up with most of the questions. So sit up straight or better yet, record your presentation while standing. It will help your voice, it will help your lung capacity, you'll be able to present much better. Try and minimize hand movements or other distracting habits. I touch my face, uh, I rub my hands together, I talk with my hands. Uh, one of the reasons why I turned off the video is because I live in rural Saskatchewan and I don't have uh, very good internet. And so it was more important for you to hear me than to see me. But if you do get a chance to see me, you'll see that my hands move all the time. It can be quite distracting. So it's something to think about. Dress professionally. All that means is if you're wearing a t-shirt, that's fine. Try and make sure that there isn't any ice cream on it. That happened to me. Um, yeah, that was not that's very professional. So try and dress clean and professionally as, as much as you can. The last point is to record yourself practicing and watch yourself for strengths and weaknesses. You'll see watching yourself where you can improve. It's weird. I recognize that. I hate watching myself. I don't like listening to myself after I've been recorded, but it really does help. It allows you to reassess what you're doing and think about what you can do better. Here's a funny thing. At the beginning of your three minute presentation, please introduce yourself. Introduce your supervisor and any other team member members who contributed to your project. Then you can jump into your hook and away you go. You're through your two or three points, drive home your conclusions, and away you go. But please remember to introduce yourself at the beginning of your three minute talk. At the end, please thank everyone for visiting your poster. They are going to be able to see your poster and watch your recording at any time over those, over the, the judges will be able to see it over about a five day session. It will be live to the public for three days. Um, do make sure that you thank everyone for visiting your poster. So two little technical things at the beginning and the end. And that's it. Your three minute research talk. Here's your recap. I want you to aim for a non-specialist audience. That means don't write it for someone who's already in your lab. They're going to understand all your background stuff, but someone from a lab all the way across the university in health sciences or engineering, they may have good technical background, just not your technical background. So aim for a non-specialist audience. The second, your oral talk enhances and sells your research. You are the storyteller, you're the cheerleader, and you're the tour guide. Your oral talk enhances and sells what you've done. And then, I, and I really want you to do this, practice, practice, practice. The more you practice, the better your presentation is going to be. Okay, everybody take a stretch. Here's your husky hug. Big stretch. As we move into the second part of our presentation today. And it'll be really short, which means that there's going to be lots and lots of time for you all to ask questions when we're done. The next part that I want to talk about today is the elevator pitch. So an elevator pitch, if any of you have heard it before or not heard it before, an elevator pitch, the concept is, is that you've just gotten, you're going to have a job interview, for example, with uh, a human resources specialist or even with a boss of a particular company that you really want to work with or perhaps a faculty member that you really want them to take you on as an undergraduate student researcher or potentially as a graduate student. So you have 30 seconds. Let's say that you walked onto the elevator and they walked on right behind you. You know that you're going down 15 floors and you have about 30 seconds, maybe as long as a minute, to give them your pitch. That's the concept behind the elevator pitch and why it's called that is that you're on an elevator, it's just the two of you, you have this moment together to tell them who you are 
30 seconds to get what you want. So let's imagine this. We, all, we only have, what, two elevators on campus uh, in the Arts Tower, which is 10 floors, and the Agriculture glass, Greek Glass Elevator, that's six floors. But So let's do a slightly alternative scenario. Let's say that you're standing next to your potential dream future faculty supervisor for your undergraduate research or potentially for a graduate, and you're standing in line at Tim Hortons. What do you say? Here's the thing, you can't actually come up with this off the top of your head, or very, very, very few people can come up with this off the top of their head in the moment. That's why it's always good to have an elevator pitch in your back pocket and to practice it. Now, to set that for any particular scenario, you'd have to think about a different scenario for each potential faculty super. It's like, oh, I could work with them, or I could work with them, or I could work with this other guy over here, and that'd be great. Yeah, you'd really have to craft different pitches, probably slightly different pitches for each of the three. So ideally, you would have the perfect particular business, job, or faculty supervisor in mind. And that's what you do. So what do you say? The first is, who are you? And this is what I wrote. My name is Merle Massey, and I'm a researcher who's fascinated by the art of storytelling. Especially, why do we tell stories the way we do? And what do we do when stories do not match? And this is actually who I am. And I have thought, I'll just pause in my, in my 30 second elevator pitch and give you the background on this particular context. Who you are is not actually, um, I'm a third year graduate student, or I'm the coordinator of undergraduate research, I'm also a mom, I'm a farmer, I'm an author. That's Those are things that I've done or things that I'm currently doing. But who are you within a research context or within a job hunting context is about who you are as a researcher or who you are as an employee. What are the things that you are really, really interested in? This is from a research perspective, this is the heart and soul of my research. I pay attention to why we tell stories the way we do and what we do when stories don't match. That's what I pay attention to. So I watch the way a media story is crafted. If, if it's a story about indigenous pro protest uh, and people uh, creating a blockade, you can tell the difference between those that talk about how illegal it is and how it's stopped uh, traffic and, and how this is a problem. So they're looking at Indigenous pro protest as a problem versus those who look at Indigenous protest as, as being a resurgence of Indigenous people exercising their land rights. And the way that they frame that story is very different, but that's, that's the sort of thing that I pay attention to. So think about who you are as a researcher. What are you truly interested in? What's at the heart of what you study? The second is creating the connection. What's the connection between you and your dream faculty supervisor or your dream professional job? Do the research on the company or on the faculty member. Do the research first. Know where they're at, what they're up to, where they're going. Read their, read their um, websites, read their business syllabuses, see what they're up to. That will help you craft your pitch. So if I was going to do a pitch, I would say something like this. And in my mind, I have Dr. Maureen Reed at the time. I heard about your recent grant where you're looking to study flooding issues at the community level. I'm fascinated by how different groups talk about and respond to flood events, the scientists, government agencies, indigenous people, for example. They all use different ways of talking about or responding to flood. Their stories, even of the very same flood event, don't always line up or agree. I'm wondering if you'd consider adding me to your research team as a postdoctoral fellow to pursue this aspect of your flood research project. And that would be a classic and simple pitch. You've given them exactly, you've shown that you've made the connection to what they're doing. You're paying attention to what they're doing and where they're going and what's happened to them recently. And then you show, this is how I fit. And this is how I think a, an interesting direction that your research can go. So you give them some thoughts and you open the conversation. Then the third aspect of this is to finish strong. Why you? Why are you the best fit for that particular faculty member or that particular job? And I would say something like, I'm an award-winning author who's worked on numerous projects from public to academic. 
I would probably also add that I've done uh, extensive community engagement, including Indigenous engagement, and this is something I'm very proud of and, and uh, willing to share. And I would say I'd be happy to discuss this potential research work further at your convenience. Here's my card. Would it be all right with you if I follow up again in a few days? And they will tell you at that point, yeah, that's great. Or they'll say, no, I'm sorry, it's full. And so that's that comes to the end of their pitch. But at the same time, they know who you are. They know that you've been thinking about their project, that you're knowledgeable, that you're up to date on what they're up to, and that you're available and interested. That's some of the most important things that you can do. So that's an elevator pitch in a nutshell. Who you, you tell them you know who you are, you tell them who you are, you do the, your research on what they're up to, whether it's a company or a faculty member, you build your pitch so that it shows both your knowledge and your connection to what they're doing, and you finish strong. You tell them why you are the best candidate for this particular uh, work, and that's it. That is an elevator pitch and what it does. So this is a picture of me baking. I bake a lot. Um, I love to bake. And writing and presenting is very much like baking. Sure, you can follow the recipe, but it still takes practice. Every time you want to do something in the public, as any kind of an oral presentation or a written presentation, the more you do, the better you get at it. So if you start out this year and you're still and you're in the practice phase and you don't feel like you've done it perfect the first time, that's okay. Because going forward, you're going to build on that experience. And each time you do it, you're going to get that much better. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for uh, listening to the presentation. I am going to stop the recording and then Anyone who has questions will be able to ask them.